Hello everyone, my name is AJ Keefe, and in this presentation I'll be covering the paper titled GSK Beta Mediated Phosphorylation of MCL1 Regulates Axonal Autophagy to Promote Wallerian Degeneration, published in the Journal of Cell Biology. I want to extend a special thanks to the authors for their contribution to this field of research. And for this video, I recommend that my viewers pause the video at each new slide and read through the material and analyze the graphics before actually playing my voice. And if you have any questions, uh, please comment below and thanks for watching. Wallerian degeneration is simply the process of axon degeneration following injuries such as transection or the um, cutting of an axon, um, also caused by dysfunctions in transport. Uh, neuronal apoptosis can cause Wallerian degeneration uh, or even overactivation of autophagy, and we'll see that in this paper. And one major reason to be interested in Wallerian degeneration is that it often precedes uh, neuron death in various models of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Huntington's disease or Alzheimer's disease. So Wallerian degeneration might represent the first stages of a neurodegenerative disease. So understanding how neurons, um, how axons degenerate could pave the way to, to therapies for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Now, before moving on, there's there's <clears throat> there's one very important distinction to be made between mouse models of Wallerian degeneration and what we think happens in vivo during neurodegeneration. So, Wallerian degeneration models are centered around the paradigm of simply severing an axon, cutting it, and observing how degeneration operates at the molecular scale. And we need to be cognizant to the fact that. Unless you are interested in a disease like chronic traumatic encephalopathy or the um, axon shearing from physical force, these models of physical injury to, to, to axons may not be applicable to neurodegenerative diseases. For example, the process by which a, an axon degenerates following axon cleavage might not have anything to do with how axons degenerate in a disease like Huntington's disease or Alzheimer's disease. And this is mainly because when an axon degenerates during neurodegeneration, it's still attached to the cell body. So how an axon degenerates in neurodegenerative diseases may be fundamentally different from how an axon degenerates following transection. So physically cleaving an axon is, is great for experimental purposes because it's an easy way to induce axon degeneration, but its relationship to neurodegenerative diseases may not be directly applicable. And since that's my personal topic of interest, I felt the need to make that disclaimer before getting into the paper. But nevertheless, the physical severing of an, of an axon is critically marked by the activation of these two proteins. We, we have AKT up here, or sorry, the inactivation. It's marked by the inactivation of AKT and inactivation of NMNAT2. So you may know AKT as, the down, or, um, as a downstream growth faggling growth factor uh, signaling kinase, and it's generally functions to promote cell survival and it actively inhibits stress uh, kinase signaling pathways, such as the MAP cake pathway. And the loss of AKT uh, following transection occurs through this uh, ZNRF1 ubiquitin ligase that targets AKT for degradation. And the loss of AKT's pro-survival signaling as well as it, the loss of its inhibition of MAPK pathways, um, basically opens the door to Wallerian degeneration. And one very critical stress kinase that is constitutively inhibited by AKT is GSK3 beta. So this is GSK3 beta is a part of, of what's going on right here in the MAPK pathway. So when AKT is degraded by ZNRF1, it releases GSK3 beta from these inhibitory phosphorylations. And we'll see in this paper what GSK3 beta does once it's activated. We also see the degradation of uh, NMNAT2. It's an enzyme derived from the NAD biosynthesis pathway, which I thought was kind of strange at first. So you may recall that NAD is a universal electron carrier that is reduced into NADH during um, glycolysis. and or the citric acid cycle. And it, it, NAD, the NADH shuttles electrons into the electron transport chain. 
And so the purpose of NMN82 is to produce more NAD from its precursor NMN. And this, this is a critical function in axon survival, the conversion of uh, the, the production of NAD, because when uh, NMN82 is upregulated, the axon survives transection. So it's not a trivial enzyme. And in the loss of NMN82 following transection causes NAD biosynthesis to, to drop, and it causes an energetic crisis in, in the cell, um, leading to uh, axon degeneration. And you can see in this graphic down here that uh, NMN82 depletion is the primary event that's occurring during the latent period of axon degeneration. And NAD loss is, once NAD is sufficiently downregulated, that's when active degeneration ensues. <clears throat> so the primary, um, the two primary proteins that are inactivated following transection are AKT and its pro-growth signaling and NMNAT2 and its NAD biosynthesis. So two other proteins are subsequently activated following transection, and this includes the stress kinases derived from the MAPK pathway. Most notably, we have DLK and its downstream partner, JNK. JNK is a very well-known stress signaling kinase, and it's activated following transection. And inhibiting uh, JNK, you can see down here, inhibiting JNK is, is protective to, um, or it prolongs the uh, time it takes for an axon to de degenerate. Uh, another stress kinase that we should keep in mind is G uh, GSK3 beta, which in this paper we're discussing. And another important player, or the most important player, I, I, I should say, is SARM1. SARM1 is the number one inducer of, of um, axon degeneration following transection. And that's why it's bolded in this graphic up here. So it was first discovered by accident, and the researchers noticed that when this protein was missing, axons did not degenerate for several weeks, actually, after transection. And scientists discovered that this protein, SARM1, uh, despite lacking enzymatic activity, somehow causes the, ra the rapid cleavage and the rapid loss of NAD following activation by dimerization. So these TIR domains on SARM uh, induced dimerization, and it's somehow activated following um, uh, axon transection. And it, there, there's evidence that the uh, J and K actually activates SARM-1. But regardless, once SARM-1 is activated, it just begins mass cleaving NAD. And that combined with the loss of NMNAT2 causes a rapid, uh, a, a, a huge loss of NAD and energetic failure and the cell um, then activates the degradation of cytoskeletal components, such as through um, calpanes or uh, SGC or SCG10, which is a microtubule stabilizing protein. Um, and also one last point that I want to mention is that Wallerian degeneration, despite being related to apoptosis, actually has nothing to do with the conventional uh, mitochondrial pathway of apoptosis. That means that the, the activation of things like caspases or cytochrome C or the apoptosome, all that is probably secondary to what we're discussing here because inhibiting a, a critical protein like uh, APAF1, the apoptosome, you can even completely knock out the apoptosome and we still see uh, axon degeneration uh, as usual. You can also inhibit caspases, um, you can inhibit cytochrome C release, and all of this has uh, does not ha do much in terms of preventing um, active degeneration of axons. All right, so sorry for the long introduction, but um, in this paper, there's quite a lot of concepts that are being integrated um, together. So anyways, the, the original impetus for this study was spurred by sifting through an unbiased screen of genes that modulate the rate of Wallerian degeneration. And they came across these two peculiar genes, uh, MCL1 and GSK3 beta. 
And the reason they were immediately interested in these two genes is that GSK3 beta is already known to be a stress activated kinase. And MCL1 is a, a BCL2 protein linked to apoptosis. Uh, by, by BCL2, I mean that MCL1 is a protein that constitutively inhibits back and backs and prevents pore formation at the mitochondria. MCL1 is also indicated or implicated in modulating uh, autophagy. And we'll see how um, that is discovered in this paper. But furthermore, um, it's already been observed by previous researchers that GSK3 beta uh, phosphorylates MCL1 and promotes its proteasomal degradation. And so the original question was simply, how do MCL1 and GSK3 beta contribute to the process of axon degeneration? And they theorized that since that, that since GSK3 beta is capable of targeting MCL1 to the proteasome, perhaps this same interaction is pertinent to axon degeneration. And so the next question is, if this is indeed true, um, how might degrading MCL1 be relevant to axon degeneration? And the hint that I provided is, is autophagy. MCL1 degradation promotes autophagy. And we'll get into that in a second. Um, let's first go through the, the, um, the results of the paper. So the first thing that was confirmed by the researchers is that MCL1 is indeed phosphorylated by GSK3 beta and preventing this single interaction between MCL1 and GSK3 beta significantly reduced the rate of axon degeneration following transection. Next, they discovered that GSK3 beta mediated phosphorylation of MCL1 uh, induced the degradation of MCL1 by uh, FBXW7. FBXW7 is a ubiquitin ligase that targets phosphorylated MCL1 to the proteasome. So again, this is the path, the pathway that had been previously confirmed and they were just confirming it in their model of degeneration, of Wallerian degeneration. And they found that FBXW7 induced degradation of MCL1 was critical for the induction of autophagy during Wallerian degeneration. So the loss of MCL1 following GSK3 beta phosphorylation and ubiquitination by FBXW7 induced autophagy. And it was discovered that the dissociation of Becklin1 from MCL1 was the, ca was the cause uh, of the uh, autophagy initiation. So Becklin1, uh, briefly, we'll get into this later. Becklin1 is simply a protein that activates autophagy. So um, degradation of MCL1 by phosphorylation, by GSK3 beta phosphorylation and FBXW7 ubiquitination releases Becklin1 from um, its inhibitory interaction with MCL1 and this activates autophagy. And then, so the, then the final part of this paper was characterizing the, the importance of MCL1 degradation medi mediated autophagy activation. And autophagy was found to be critical to Wallerian degeneration by providing an initial boost to ATP levels and also for, for the subsequent exposure of phosphatidylserine for recognition by macrophages. So we're, we're gonna go through each step uh, slide by slide. And this presentation is gonna come out a little bit longer than usual, but there's also a ton of great information packed in this presentation. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, let's get into the results. In order to first test and confirm that MCL1 was important to the process of axon degeneration, the, the authors began by conduct, conducting a Western blot towards phosphorylated MCL1 at residue uh, serine 140. It's, it's a previously characterized phosphorylation uh, that's, that's known to be targeted by GSK3 beta. So they, they're using an antibody towards phosphorylated serine at residue 140. And in, the, in this top right figure, we see that MCL1 phosphorylation at serine 140 increases three hours post transection. So this is zero, zero uh, hour zero, one hour after transection, three hours after transection. And we see that the amount of phosphorylated MCL1 is increasing over time. And importantly, 
the inhibition of GSK3 beta using TDZD uh, mostly prevented the phosphorylation of, of MCL1. So again, this, this small molecule, which is absent in these first three lanes, is TDZD, and it's a known uh, and very specific inhibitor of GSK3 beta. And what they, again, what they found is that the application of this GSK3 beta inhibitor mostly prevented uh, MCL1 phosphorylation at 140. And also um, not shown here in this slide, but they also found that overexpression of an enzyme uh, deficient GSK3 beta enzyme prevented MCL1 phosphorylation. So having established an interaction between GSK3 beta and MCL1, they then decided to see how enzyme deficient GSK3 beta and in um, unphosphorylatable MCL1 affect the rate of Waldnerian degeneration. So in this bottom figure, we see the results of various transfection mediated gene overexpression experiments. And when an enzyme dead version of GSK3 to, uh, 3 beta is overexpressed right here in this condition, this GSK3 beta K85M, when it's overexpressed, the degeneration index of axons in vitro, or sorry, this is all in vivo in, in culture, um, but it drops by about 70%, right? So I think the most important uh, timestamp period is at 24 hours right here. So I have, I have all the 24 hour time marks um, indicated by these little blue stars. I added these blue stars. So 24 hours is indicated by each of these. You can see at 24 hours, um, uh, when, when GSK3 beta's enzymatic activity has been abolished, we see roughly um, the amount of degeneration drops by about 70% at 24 hours compared to these two control conditions. So this is this condition right here is wild type normal control. And this condition is transfection of Cree, which is a transfection control experiment. Um, Overexpressing MCL1 right here, or MCL1S140A, which cannot be phosphorylated by GSK3 beta, because uh, we remember up here, we're looking at phosphorylated serine 140. Well, in this condition right here, they mutated serine 140 into alanine, and that prevents phosphorylation. We can see that um, both these MCL1 overexpression or MCL1 that cannot be phosphorylated uh, decreases the degeneration of axons by about 50% at uh, 24 hours compared to the control conditions. And just for comparisons to the gold standard of experimental axon survival, they knocked down SARM using shRNA in this last condition. And so this was a kind of a negative control because they knew that SARM1 uh, very potently inhibited axon degeneration. So this is kind of for visualization and a negative control. I added this slide just for visualization pur uh, purposes. And sadly, I think this is the only uh, slide with immunohistochemistry. But um, regardless, we see that no in no transection, we have these, this is what healthy non-transected uh, axons look like. Um, trans, uh, transfection followed by, or transsection followed by transfection of Cree. Um, this is a control condition. We see tons of axons degenerating. And we see uh, GSK3 beta dead uh, enzyme deficient version. And we, we see very little degrad uh, degeneration. We see MCL1 overexpression, um, very little degeneration. Uh, MCL1 that cannot be phosphorylated, we see maybe a little bit of degeneration, but not much. And SARM1, which shows uh, no degeneration. And I think all this was done at uh, hour 24, by the way, too. But this, this is just for visualization. So you know uh, in, your, in your head what's going on when they talk about degenerating axons. This slide is related to the previous slides, but they are testing the ability of these various conditions uh, to slow Wallerian degeneration in vivo. So the previous experiments were in a culture um, of cells. And the, so the difference is that in this experiment, um, they're looking at 
in a, a live animal in vivo. And they're looking at the, um, uh, they're delivering all these different transcripts and they're over expressing them by uh, adenovirus mediated delivery. So they're uh, transducing all these different transcripts and they're over expressing them. And so after they transduce one of these uh, proteins, they then uh, transect, they, they do a little surgical transection of the retinal ganglion axons. And they, so they get in there and they cut them. And then uh, two, di two DOS means two days after sectioning, they're, they're t taking the animal and they're looking at what happened. And then five DAS uh, days after sectioning and the survival of axons is then measured by the expression of neurofilament M, uh, which simply labels axons and their their density is assessed and it's normalized to beta actin. Um, so we see by by five days, axons are are pretty much completely decimated in the two control conditions. Um, so in Cree and GFP, we see very little ac uh, axon density and they're, they're, the axons are mostly resilient in the in in the uh, GSK three beta K eighty five M condition. So the enzyme dead version of GSK three beta is is saving uh, axons for the most part. But although um, curiously, the MCL one and MCL one that cannot be phosphorylated, um, they show a trend of increased survival, but it's not statistically significant. But it is uh, statistically significant at two days after trans, uh, sectioning. So we say we see after two days that MCL1, MCL1 that cannot be phosphorylated and GSK3 beta enzyme dead version are all significantly more, uh, produce significantly more dense axons uh, two days after sectioning, indicating um, that axons are not degenerating when these these different transcripts are overexpressed. So at this point, we can say that GSK3 beta and MCL1 are cooperating to promote Wallerian degeneration from experiments um, both in culture and in vivo in the live animal. But we still don't know how GSK3 beta's phosphorylation of MCL1 uh, leads to axon degeneration. So that's what they're going to be looking at next. So what's the big deal with GSK3 beta phosphorylating MCL1? Why is that such an important process? Well, previous studies have identified this as a mechanism of inducing MCL1 degradation in the proteasome um, or the UPS, uh, ubiquitin proteasomal system. To see if MCL1 was <clears throat> being degraded after transection, they performed this Western blot at the bottom down here. What we see is that the mitochondrial MCL1 expression is markedly reduced following transection. So we see three hours post transection in wild type cells, the amount of mitochondrial MCL1 is, is vastly reduced. So in addition, uh, blocking GSK3 beta with a TDZD um, inhibitor. So we see in these other, these next two conditions that when this uh, GSK3 beta ad inhibitor is present, that the degradation of mitochondrial MCL1 is blocked. And then preventing, furthermore, preventing MCL1 phosphorylation by this with this S140A also um, prevents the downregulation of MCL1 three hours post transection. So we see that uh, MCL1 in normal conditions is being degraded three hours after transection and blocking uh, GSK3 beta with the TDZD prevents MCL1 degradation. We also see that when uh, MCL1 cannot be phosphorylated, we also see it persist after uh, transectioning. And on the bottom right, we see an immunoprecipitation of MCL1 following, um, followed by Western blot staining of ubiquitin. So they're pulling down MCL1 with an antibody and they're staining for ubiquitin in the Western blot. And in order to capture significant amounts of ubiquitinated MCL1, they needed to inhibit the proteasome with this uh, MG132 because this causes the 
accumulation of ubiquitinated substrate because it's not degraded. And you can see, we see this in, in many other conditions, but when the MG132 is not there, that there's, it's not, um, there's not enough ubiquitinated proteins to really make out any differences. Um, and we see, but we see in this, this uh, fourth lane right here, that um, inhibition of the proteasome caused the accumulation of ubiquitinated MCL only followed uh, by trans, uh, transection. So inhibiting the proteasome in, in this third lane doesn't cause accumulation of MCL1, of ubiquitinated MCL1, right? Because all that's happening in this, this lane right here is that uh, the proteasome is inhibited. Nothing interesting happening. But when you inhibit the proteasome and um, transect and cut the, the axons, we see the accumulation of ubiquitinated um, MCL1, indicating that MCL1 is being degraded by ubiquitination. We also see this uh, ubiquitination is dependent on uh, or GSK3 beta because when we when when there's inhibition when there's inhibition of TDZD there's no more um, there's no more MCL1 ubiquitination. So inhibition of GSK3 beta prevents the ubiquitination of uh, MCL1. In the top right figure, we see the quantification of ubiquitinated MCL1 uh, from Western blots like this one down here, uh, but they're doing it using different MCL1 uh, isoforms. So the, the, only the MG132 lanes over here on the right are interesting. These ones over here, none of these are significant because uh, ubiquitinated proteins are just being degraded. But in these, in these uh, proteasomal inhibition lanes, we see some pretty interesting things. We have, so we have three different forms of MCL1. We have one, which is wild type. This is just normal MCL1. And again, it's not surprising that the ubiquitination is upregulated. That's what we saw down here, right here. Then we also have uh, S140, the S140A MCL1. So this is the MCL1 that cannot be phosphorylated by GSK3 beta. So this lane right here, which is vastly, uh, significantly downregulated in its phosphorylation, is the one that cannot be phosphorylated. And then we have this SD. This is this is a what's called a phosphomimetic that looks phosphorylated. So it's, it's basically, this is a constitutively phosphorylated MCL1 because it, it looks phosphorylated. And when MCL1 looks phosphorylated, we can we, we see that the amount of ubiquitinated uh, MCL1 is, is vastly upregulated. So all this is to say, this entire slide is to say that GSK3 beta is phosphorylating and inducing MCL1 ubiquitination and that's prevented by preventing the, the phosphorylation site because that prevents uh, ubiquitination. To identify the ubiquitin ligase responsible for MCL1 ubiquitination, they turned to the use of shRNA, we can see down here, and to see if shRNA towards either mule or FBXW7, uh, which are both known um, ubiquitin ligases that target MCL1. We can see MULE stands for MCL1 ubiquitin ligase E3, and FBX7 also targets MCL1. So they wanted to see if knockdown of either of these transcripts, uh, of, of either of these proteins, reduce the amount of ubiquitinated MCL1 following proteasome inhibition. And we see down here that knockdown of uh, FBXW7 using either of these two uh, shRNA transcripts was able to reduce the amount of ubiquitinated um, MCL1 uh, following proteasome inhibition right here. And so in the bottom left figure, we see that this inhibition of MCL1 um, ubiquitination has physiological consequences because the uh, inhibition of MCL1 ubiquitination by shRNA of um, knockdown of FBXW7 significantly reduced the axon degeneration index at 24 hours post-transection. We see right here in these two conditions that when you knock down FBXW7, which in this graph is shown to 
reduce ubiquitinated MCL1. When, when FBX W7 is knocked down, it um, increases axon survival following transection. So all this is to, is to say that uh, GSK3 beta mediated phosphorylation of MCL1 at residue 140 is recruiting this FBXW7 ubiquitin ligase because knockdown of only FBXW7 is capable of reducing its uh, MCL1's ubiquitination. So what happens after GSK3 beta induces the degradation of MCL1 through the that FBXW7 ubiquitin ligase? You know, why, why is this important? Why, why should we be excited about it? And it turns out that GSK3 beta, uh, MCL1 and FBXW7, uh, turn out, it turns out they modulate autophagy in degenerating axons. So they assayed the ability of, of three different uh, transfected constructs, GSK3 beta S9A, constitutively active, GSK3 beta, uh, constitutively active AKT, and MCL1 S140A that cannot be phosphorylated. So they tested these three different constructs in their ability to induce autophagy as measured by LC3 uh, two staining. So LC3 is a marker of autophagosomes and the amount of LC3 two to LC3 one ratio tells us how many autophagosomes are present in, in these axons. So this is all, they're all looking at axons right here. So in the control condition, we see that basal autophagy right here um, we see there's very low basal autophagy when there's no transection. Uh, following transection right here, indicated by this plus, we see a huge increase in the amount, uh, about a tenfold uh, increase in the ratio of LC3 to unprocessed inactive LC3. So transection activates autophagy. They then uh, transfected a constitutively active, hyperactive uh, GSK3 beta kinase, and they observed uh, upregulation of autophagy even in basal conditions. So GSK3 beta hyperactivation alone is able to induce autophagy in the axon. That's pretty interesting. Uh, they then transfected a um, uh, myristolated, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It's, it's just a lipidated AKT that is constitutively active because it's, it's constitutively localized to the membrane where it gets activated. And remember, Earlier, I mentioned that AKT inhibits GSK3 beta, and AKT also inhibits autophagy by active or uh, yeah by activating mTORC, and the combined effect of which is is that AKT constitutive activity inhibits autophagy even following transection. So this is what inhibited autophagy looks like using a a um, a conventional inhibitor of autophagy. This is what autophagy inhibition looks like. Then the big finding is that MCL1 S140A mutation um, that prevents M uh, MCL1 phosphorylation prevents autophagy following transection. So in this panel right here, I think this is the biggest finding of the paper is that this single uh, mutation S140A in MCL1 prevents autophagy following transection. So right here we see this transection and there's no autophagy induction this by this uh, single little mutation. So the, the question now is, is why does MCL1 phosphorylation at 140, uh, why is that required for autophagy? And another question is why is autophagy important in um, the process of axon degeneration? To probe this system a little more, they generated ATG deficient neurons that lacked the ability to form autophagosomes. And here on the right, we see that the loss of ATG proteins, which are uh, required to form the autophagosome, uh, prevented or at least significantly impaired the ability to induce autophagy following transection. And, and that's not really too surprising. Um, what is surprising is, is that the loss of FBXW7 followed, uh, induced by the uh, SHRNA towards FBXW7 also prevented the induction of, of autophagy following transection. And it does it to about the same degree as ATG knockouts. So, so preventing FBXW7's ubiquitination of something, maybe presumably probably uh, MCL1, caused a reduction in autophagy that's comparable to 
or even more so than um, ATG5 knockouts. We also see down here that the accumulation of P63 indicating uh, car, uh, autophagy cargo is not being shuttled to the autophagosome. And so the, the question is, does the loss of, auto of autophagy actually have any meaningful consequences for axon degeneration? Should we actually, should we care that um, autophagy isn't being initiated following transection? Is that important? And according to these sets of experiments depicted in this bottom graph, the answer is yes. Uh, the loss of autophagy by either ATG protein knockdown or by FBXW7 knockdown significantly impairs the ability of an axon to degenerate. So the entire pathway we've been discussing is critical for the induction of autophagy following transection. And since autophagy is also critical for axon degeneration, we can basically conclude that GSK3 beta MCL1 FBXW7 mediated um, autophagy induction is critical for degeneration. So we can see, I, I mean, I would focus on 24 hours again. You see that in at 24 hours, most of the degeneration is, is mostly mild compared to the control condition. And another point, although not shown here, is that the authors also describe how induction of axonal autophagy by MCL1 downregulation by itself or by MCL1 uh, 140A expression. Uh, these single things just by downregulating MCL1 or by introducing the unphosphor uh, unph unph unphosphorylatable MCL1 are both sufficient to induce Wallerian degeneration, even without transfection or uh, transection. And I think that's really fascinating because that means. Um, MCL1 mediated Wallerian degeneration uh, can occur just by uh, overexpression, or sorry, by downregulation of MCL1 or by preventing its phosphorylation. So disrupting axonal autophagy is sufficient to induce axon degeneration um, even without any axon cutting. Or no, so that means that in diseases of axon or of, of autophagy, it's, it's conceivable that axons may be degenerating because they cannot activate autophagy. Okay, so we know that MCL1 is phosphorylated by GSK3 beta. This induces the ubiquitination and degradation of MCL1, which somehow leads to autophagy, but we don't know how this causes autophagy, and that's the big question in this slide. Well, one major idea was that MCL1 might be sequestering a protein called Becklin-1, Becklin-1 is a critical component of the, of the autophagy nucleation complex that induces the formation of the autophagosome. And Becklin-1 also contains a BH3 domain that allows it to bind BC, uh, MCL1 or other BCL2 proteins like BCLW or BCLXL. So to see if uh, MCL1 was possibly binding and sequestering Becklin-1, they did some immunoprecipitations of Becklin-1 and then they stained for MCL1. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a mute. they're pulling down Becklin-1 and they're staining for MCL1. So they have, they have three different um, transfection conditions that we need to, to note before we get into it. Um, and in each condition, they looked at the amount of MCL1 phosphorylation, as well as the amount of um, Becklin-1 pull down of MCL1 at zero, at zero and three hours post trans, transfection. So in the wild type uh, GFP transfected condition, so they're transfecting a controlled GFP, nothing interesting. We see that MCL1 phosphorylation increases three hours post uh, axotomy, post transection of the axon. So this isn't surprising. We know MCL1 is phosphorylated after transection. We see that right here. Down here, we see that in co-amino co precipitations, the amount of interaction between MCL1 and Becklin decreases. So we see that uh, wild type GFP trans transfected conditions right here. We see more MCL1 phosphorylation and less pull down of MCL1 with Becklin1. When AKT is constitutively uh, 
active and it's transfected into these axons. So here we have the constitutively active AKT condition. We see almost no phosphorylated MCL1 following trans, uh, transfect, or transection. So following axon cleavage, we see very little activated MCL1, phosphorylated MCL1. We also see uh, tons of MCL1 co-immunoprecipitating with Becklin-1. So there's a healthy relationship between uh, MCL1 and Becklin-1, as indicated by right here. So when AKT is constitutively active, we get uh, inhibition of autophagy, and it's very likely it's because of this interaction right here. MCL1 is still sequestering Becklin-1. In this last uh, construct, we, they're transducing constitutively active GSK3 beta. So this is GSK3 beta that's going to go on a phosphorylating rampage. And we see that relative to the control conditions, that the amount of phosphorylated MCL1 is vastly upregulated following three hours of after cleavage. Way more phosphorylated MCL1 right here. And we see that the interaction with MCL1 in, in Becklin is completely abolished. So three hours after transection when GSK3 beta is constitutively activated by this, this construct, um, we see almost no pull down of MCL1 following immunoprecipitation of Becklin1. So collectively, these results indicate that Becklin1, the, the primary activator of autophagy, is sequestered by unphosphorylated MCL1. Because we see in any condition where MCL1 is not phosphorylated, such as right here, or right through here. In these conditions, we see uh, tons of pull down between MCL1 and Becklin1. And when MCL1 is phosphorylated, we see the release of, of, of Becklin1 from MCL1. And this would, in the release of Becklin1 from MCL1 would be initiating autophagy. So this, this slide provides a mechanism by which um, autophagy is being activated by the release of Becklin-1 from MCL-1. The last piece of the puzzle is how does GSK-3 beta MCL-1 FBXW7 mediated Becklin release and subsequent activation of autophagy actually affect Wallerian degeneration? So what? why should we care that autophagy is being activated through this, this cascade? Well, we know autophagy promotes Wallerian degeneration because when the ATG5 proteins or ATG7 is knocked down, we don't get Wallerian degeneration. But what purpose does activating autophagy actually serve to promote Wallerian degeneration? Well, since autophagy is a catabolic activity, it might be needed for ATP uh, concentrations and upregulations. And indeed, in this bottom right figure, we see that disturbing autophagy by, by either uh, directly knocking down ATG proteins, ATG5 and 7, or by knocking down FBXW7 to prevent MCL1 degradation, uh, we see that ATP concentrations um, drastically plummet um, three hours post-transection. So we see three hours after transection right here in the gray bars, we see significantly reduced axon, uh, axonal ATP relative to the control conditions. So autophagy is needed to um, upregulate ATP following transection. And so that might sound paradoxical, but many of the axon degenerating enzymes like SARM1 or JNK mediated phosphorylation actually require ATP in order to function. And another expensive ATP dependent process is flipping a uh, phosphatidylserine to the outer leaflet of cells where it serves as a uh, phagocytic eat me signal for macrophages. So a dying cell typically will flip phosphatidylserine from the inner to the outer leaflet, and this recruits macrophages. And when autophagy was inhibited by FBXW7 knockdown, um, there was a there was decreased annexin five binding. And annexin five in this assay we see uh, annexin five intensity. Annexin five binds uh, flipped phosphatidylserine. We see that uh, when ATG5, ATG7, or FBXW7 is knocked down, 
indicating defective autophagy, that there was decreased in exon 5 binding, which indicates decreased macrophage um, eat me signals. And they tested this in vivo to see if this had uh, physiological consequences. And indeed, they found that when uh, ATG57 or FBXW or XW7 was knocked down in vivo, the, the relative number of phagocytic cells drops uh, by almost 90%. So preventing autophagy uh, prevents the re uh, recruitment of macrophages to the um, degenerating axons. So the theory is that autophagy is required for an initial boost of ATP in order to fuel the NAD depletion through SARM-1. And it's also required to flip phosphatidylserine to the outer leaflet and promote phagocytosis and the cleanup of the um, axon debris. Before going into uh, my questions, let's briefly review what this paper was all about. So GSK3 beta is activated by the loss of AKT and GSK3 beta then uh, phosphorylates GSK or MCL1, which recruits a ubiquitin ligase called FBXW7. MCL1 degradation then releases Becklin1 to initiate autophagy and the initiation of autophagy through this pathway is critical for ATP production during axon degeneration and for the uh, phagocytosis um, of the degenerated axon by macrophages. So my big number one question that has been uh, sort of haunting me throughout this paper is, are these findings applicable to non-axonomy uh, induced axon degeneration? Because we're talking about what happens to an axon after it's been cleaved from the cell body. And a part of me wonders how relevant these processes are inside the severed axon because the axon after cleavage is is kind of irrelevant to the rest of the brain unless you know unless it causes some kind of inflammatory response but what happens inside of a severed axon doesn't necessarily matter too much because it's going to die eventually why does it matter how long it takes to die if it's already been cut from the uh, neurons cell body it it unless there's an inflammatory consequence I don't see why it matters if it takes uh, 10 hours or 10 weeks to degenerate. It's kind of, uh, it's it's broken at that point once it's been cleaved, it doesn't necessarily matter. So it, it would matter if uh, these uh, molecular consequences of axotomy can be replicated in um, other pathways of axon degeneration where the axon is still attached to the cell body. For example, um, is this GSK3 beta MCL1 pathway involved in all kinds of axon degeneration pathways? We would, I, I would love to, to, to learn that. For example, could you transduce a constitutively active GSK3 beta into white matter tracts that are still attached to their uh, cell bodies? And could this cause Wallerian degeneration? So is this process, uh, is GSK3 beta overactivation capable of inducing axon degeneration, even if it's still attached to the cell body. I'm also curious how dysfunctional macrophage recruitment stemming from dysfunctional autophagy initiation might affect uh, regional inflammation weeks or even months after transection. So perhaps the inability to properly initiate autophagy and expose phosphatidylserine uh, could contribute to an inflammatory uh, condition at the site of axon cleavage and it could cause maybe some kind of autoimmune uh, issue. And I think that could be interesting to study too. Anyways, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, very robust paper. I think this is my longest presentation yet and I really enjoyed reading it. And please post any questions you have and thank you for watching.